continue our series, our journey through the Gospel of Luke. We are in Luke chapter 7. Today we'll begin at verse 18. We'll go all the way to verse 35. Uh, Now, what we've been talking about over the last several weeks, Jesus has just wrapped up what we refer to as the Sermon on the Plain, and he begins to talk about what does it look like for us to be people of the kingdom of God? Like, what does it look like to have the good life in God's kingdom? What does it look like for us to live in God's way, to be followers of Jesus? And then immediately following that teaching, Jesus goes out and a centurion or a a Roman soldier encounters him and says he's got a servant who needs to be healed. There's this whole interchange. Uh, Pastor Greg preached about this with an excellent sermon last Sunday. There's this whole interchange between Jesus and the friends of the the centurion, and they talk about authority and, and healing power, and the servant is healed. And then Jesus sees a funeral procession, and there's a widow whose son has died, and Jesus raises the son back to life. I mean, there is some incredible stuff happening. And so what Luke is doing here is he's showing us the teaching and the miraculous ministry of Jesus. Jesus' ministry is, uh, is effective, and his name is growing in renown and in popularity. And so that sets us up for what we are going to read today. And now as Luke is writing this, and we said this at the beginning of our study through Luke, Luke is a doctor, and he is a guy who likes details, and he likes uh, to build a story. And if you go back and you begin to read through the Gospel of Luke as a whole narrative, you can begin to see how Luke is constantly building on the thing that has just happened to try to demonstrate what he is trying to communicate to us about Jesus and about the way people engage with him and the way that Jesus is setting up the kingdom for us to enter into. And so it almost feels like after everything that we've seen that Jesus has done in this recent preaching and miracle working ministry, it's almost as if Luke is sitting at the table going, man, if only... There was somebody who really embodied the sermon that Jesus had just preached. If only I had a good sermon illustration to follow up Jesus' teaching. Oh, hold on a second. There's this dude named John the Baptist that came and had this encounter with Jesus. And so that's what I need to write about because, uh, because John the Baptist becomes this perfect illustration. And so he emphasizes this story right here. After all of these miracles and all of this teaching that has happened, because he wants us to see something about uh, about the kingdom, about the way Jesus engages with with people, and I think also he wants his readers to see something about their place in the kingdom. So with that being said, let's now read Luke chapter 7, this encounter that Jesus has with John the Baptist. Now, not directly. You'll see what I mean by that in a second. But he has this encounter with John the Baptist, and then he begins to talk about his, uh, his cousin and his dear friend, John. So starting in verse 18, it says, Then John's disciples told him about all these things. What did they tell him about? They told him about all of the, the ministry that's been happening, the miracles and the teachings. And so John summoned two of his disciples, and he sent them to the Lord, asking, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? It's a challenging question. And when the men reached him, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you. I love that, by the way. They're like, this was not our question. (laughs) John the Baptist sent us to ask you this question. John says, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Now, they were good disciples of John. They asked the question just the way they were told to ask it. And I love Jesus' response here. It says, at that time, Jesus healed many people of diseases, afflictions, and evil spirits, and he granted sight to many blind people. And then he replied to them, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. After John's messengers left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. And here's what he says. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? 
What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? See, those who are splendidly dressed and live in luxury are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. This was the ministry of John the Baptist, to prepare the way of Jesus the Messiah. I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John. But the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And Luke includes this kind of a side parenthetical statement. He says, and when all the people, including the tax collectors, heard this, they acknowledged God's ways of righteousness because they had been baptized by John's baptism. But since the Pharisees and experts of the law had not been baptized by him, they rejected the plan of God for themselves. And Jesus goes on. He says, to what then should I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? Jesus is good at a burn. And here it comes. They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the flute for you, but you did not dance. We sang a lament, but you did not weep. If you don't understand why that's a burn, I promise you, you'll get it by the end of the sermon. Okay, it's a good one. For John the Baptist did not come eating bread or drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. Jesus, that was a lot. Help me to be clear today. Amen. Okay, so this is kind of an unusual moment for Jesus in his ministry. Uh, Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, comes along and he sends, he sends this message by way of a couple of his own disciples. And he asks this interesting challenge of a question. And the challenge is basically, are you really the Messiah? Are you really the one that I thought that you were? And Jesus' response to the question goes something like, do a bunch of miracles, send the disciples back to report on it, and then... He kind of insults an entire generation of people and wraps it up with a statement about wisdom. That's how Jesus responds to John the Baptist's question. The the response of Jesus is really interesting and very, very important. But we actually can't move anywhere into what I think we would need to learn or what we would benefit from learning from this passage today until we fully understand this moment. So, let me give you the context that John was in that then led him or set him up to ask this question. Because John, John the Baptist didn't send two of his disciples because he was a really good teacher. He might have been a really good rabbi, a really good leader in that moment. Uh, but that's not why he sent them. It's not like he was sitting around at his John the Baptist school of baptistries uh, and, and going, hey, hey, uh, hey, hey, Brian and Bobby, can you go ask Jesus this question because I know it'll be good for you to get the experience to go out there, go on a little bit of a road trip, hunt Jesus down, ask him this question, and man, it's going to be really a blessing to your heart to find out what Jesus says. Come back and we'll discuss as a class what Jesus says. That's not what John is doing here. And it's helpful to know that he's not doing that if you know the historical context. You see, John had his two disciples come to him and sent them to ask this question from prison. John the Baptist was a little bit like Jesus in that he made people angry. So there was this guy named Herod. He was the representative of the Roman Empire at the time in the area where John the Baptist was living and doing his ministry. And Herod decided that he would uh, forsake the wife that he currently had and steal away the wife of his own brother, and he married her. If you're wondering... That was bad. Okay, so you're welcome. John the Baptist knew that that was bad, just like you knew that that was bad, and he called Herod out on his bad behavior. He said, this was a terrible thing that you did. You shouldn't have done that. And Herod just responds by this wonderful, oh, thank you so much. I'm just so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to, no, he doesn't do any of that. He throws John the Baptist in prison, and some believe that he, at this point, by the time we have this encounter in Luke chapter 7, had been in prison for maybe as long as two years at this point point. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 12 says, 
Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Think about John the Baptist in light of that proverb. He was like all of the good Jewish people of his day. He was expecting that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, was going to save. Right? He's he's thinking Jesus, if he's the Messiah, is going to do some overthrowing of governments. And he's sitting in prison looking at his watch going, hey, hey, disciples, could you go ask Jesus when he's going to get to the revolutionary part of his Messiah ministry? Maybe a jailbreak is on the menu, right? Could, could you just go ask him? Are you really? He's not asking, uh, hey, was I right, Jesus? It'd be good for my disciples to hear if you were right. He's asking, uh, I've been sitting around waiting for you to do the saving when are you going to save? See, John is actually revealing that he has had some unmet expectations for who Jesus was and what that would mean for him. And so he sends his people. Can you ask this question? I'm a little bit weary waiting for Jesus to overthrow, to be the the military ruler, can you relate? I mean, I've never been in prison, but I I do know what it feels like to have an expectation on God that he didn't meet. I do know what it feels like to, if I'm completely honest, and and I think we value being honest here at Life Church. if I'm completely honest as a human being, I know what it feels like to have expected God to do a work in my life in some way and still feel bound up by the thing that he hasn't done. And, And if I'm really being honest, I know what it feels like to doubt God's power or his love for me because he didn't do the thing I wanted him to do. And I think that's a really human experience. I think John sent his disciples to ask this question because he was having a human experience. He was having, he was wrestling with his unmet expectations and he was dealing with doubt. And I think that we can probably relate to that today. And so this is why we began our time in the Word this morning with a reflection on the places where maybe we can already relate to John the Baptist. Today, I I want us to see if we can learn from the way that John and Jesus both respond to those unmet expectations and the situation of his doubts. And and, and especially, I I want you to notice, and we'll get to this towards the end, Jesus' final thought on this matter. Jesus, we'll come back around to this, but Jesus ends his thoughts with a response to John's question with this simple and profound statement. He says, wisdom is vindicated by all of her children. And just so you can hold this in your understanding as we go through today, what Jesus is saying here is, that a person is wise, or you can tell that a person is wise, not by what comes out of their mouth, but by the decisions and choices they make with their life, right? I mean, if we're thinking thinking back to the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus is saying that uh, a good tree will produce good fruit. Wisdom is vindicated or proven to be wise by the fruit that grows up out of your life. And Jesus is clearly inspired by John the Baptist here, uh, not just by John's question, but by the way that John lived his life. And so I wonder today what we might learn about how to live a life that Jesus would also call wise. So this is the invitation. Let's go back to the very beginning of the story to see uh, what Jesus saw in John that was worthy of this kind of praise to say, He is a wise person. He says some other really wonderful things about John. And then I I wonder if we can see what we might learn along the way about what it looks like for us to be wise. And so we begin with the very important practice that John takes as the first step of the story. John initiates the story as we see that John brought his doubts to Jesus. Now, I think a few minutes ago we established that in this room we have had doubts. The question is, what are you doing with them? John sets the tone for us by bringing his doubts to the right place. Remember what John was expecting. He was expecting Jesus, the Messiah, to be a warrior king, right? 
And we know that doubt is a common response when Jesus does not fulfill the expectations that we place on him. And so there is a, a, a challenge in following Jesus when we have expectations on Jesus is that he has a tendency to not change just so that he can meet our expectations. He has a tendency of allowing us to be wrong in our expectations and and. Maybe you've been annoyed with Jesus about this a time or two. I certainly have. That sometimes Jesus will allow us to have wrong expectations on him and not say anything about it. But Jesus, why did you let me have that wrong expectation of you for so long? And it's almost as if Jesus was saying, well, you were really believing it. So it seemed like it meant a lot to you to believe that that was the way that I would be. So let's talk about that. So, common expectations that are placed on Jesus. What, what are some? Uh, money will increase, <laughs> right? This, there's, a, there's a kind of a, 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 I think Pentecostals get blamed for this narrative quite a bit, and there's certainly some veins within Pentecostalism uh, that do some weird stuff with money, and we go, if you give the right amount, then God will, like, multiply that. And, like, we, we think that God is, like, beholden to our ability to do math, and, uh, and, and so if I give a certain amount, then God is now legally obligated to give me a certain amount back, and, and this is how you got a fancy car, right? Uh, that's an expectation that some people place on God. I remember talking to a guy one time, he had, uh, he had a drug addiction, and then he gave his life to Jesus, and then he was still addicted to drugs. And so he came into the church for a few months, and then the temptation was still there, and we were talking with him, we were doing all the things that we were doing, like, let's put this guy in community, let's recommend some places where he can go and get some help, even outside the church, let's pray in the name of Jesus for him to be released from all of the temptation, like, we were going the whole nine yards for this dude, and he was doing some of the work for a little while, and one day he came in, and he goes, hey, this is going to be the last time that you see me, I've decided that God's not real, because he hasn't completely fixed all of the problems in my life in the last three weeks. And I said, you were thinking that God was going to fix all of the problems in your life in three weeks? And he's like, yeah, isn't that what it means to be a Christian? I said, if that's what it meant to be a Christian, I mean, yeah, like, God has totally failed us. I'm so sorry that you misunderstood who Jesus is and what he was supposed to do to you. Please, would you stay? And then this guy proceeded for years after that to just really struggle, bouncing back and forth between this expectation that he had on God, that he would one day just wake up and everything would just be fixed just because he prayed a prayer one time on a Sunday morning in a room. It was really sad to watch that, but we really do this quite a bit. That's an extreme example, but maybe you can think of some ways that you've expected that God would. But that relationship's going to work out. I'm a Christian. It's got to, right? I prayed about it, I fasted once about it, or I fast every day about it, or every week about it. I'm, I'm doing all of the work. Isn't God going to do his part? We have expectations. And sometimes we even read scripture, and, and we see that Jesus heals, and that when we lay hands on the sick, that they will be healed in the name of Jesus. And so we put expectations on God, and we say, well, certainly... Every single person that ever gets prayed for in the name of Jesus must be healed. Otherwise, it's the person's fault. Right? We put the ex expectations. And now, wisdom will teach you to know how to still pray for healing because you know and believe and see that Jesus still heals today and hold in tension the reality that some people take longer to be healed than my demands on God's timing but I'll still pray. Like, for example, my mom was diagnosed with Parkinson's a little over a decade ago. Like, we pray for her every day to be healed. And I believe she is healed by the stripes of Jesus. My mom is healed in the name of Jesus. I believe that at the core of my being. But when I saw her just the other day, her hand is still tremoring. And, and there's just this subtle conversation I have with God every time that I see my mom and her hand tremors. And I just, it's just a quick conversation with God where I go, God, I'm still praying about that, still waiting for, for you to do that, still believing my mom is healed. Just, I'm looking forward to the day where she's going to come and go, look at this. I, I know it's going to happen. I absolutely know that it's going to happen. 
Now ask me how and why and when and all of that in a different sermon. The sermon isn't about healing. The sermon is about your expectations and my expectations. Now the problem would be is if my expectations saw my mom's hand tremor and say, see, God's not a healer. Right? Or I shouldn't actually keep praying for my mom. So what we're actually having a conversation about is how John saw Jesus doing something other than what he was expecting, and he was trying to reconcile, how is it that I haven't seen what I thought I was going to see yet, and you're still the Savior of the world? How do those two things get married together? And this, I believe, friends, is, number one, why Jesus says it is wisdom that understands this. I don't know that it's your logic and reason. It is wisdom that understands how these two things coexist, right? This, take, this, takes, this is a mature Christian conversation that we are having. And John takes the first step in getting to that wise understanding of how these two things are married together by taking his doubt and being honest before Jesus. Honest before him and saying, Jesus, I genuinely don't get it. I have questions. See, wisdom understands that when Jesus does not meet my expectations, it was never Jesus who was wrong. Jesus has never been wrong. It might be good for you to tell your neighbor that. Go ahead and let's do old school church for a second. Tell your neighbor, Jesus has never been wrong. Never once, never been wrong. I've been wrong already today. But expectations placed on relationships that we then don't present in a healthy way can break up relationships. Have you ever been on the side of a relationship where someone put unrealistic expectations on you and then broke up the relationship because you didn't meet an expectation that you could never have met? I had a, had a person that my wife and I were friends with for a season who asked me to meet them for a coffee one time and they said that they were upset with me and that I wasn't a good friend. And I said, could you explain to me why I'm not a good friend? I, if I've done something, I, I want to repent before you and the Lord and make it right. And they said they were mad at me because every time that they saw that I was in a picture and my family were in pictures with other groups of friends and they weren't in the picture, they were really hurt by that. And that was a difficulty, and I, so I'm trying to be sympathetic to this, you know. And, and then I tried to also explain in logic and reason with this person who was my friend to say, well, like 75% of the things that you said that you wish you were in those pictures, you, we invited you to the thing, right? And so there's some kind of cognitive dissonance happening. But what was happening was more the, the more that we talked, the more I realized this is a really emotional conversation. And what's happening is you've placed an expectation on me that no matter what I say right now, I just simply cannot perform to the level of relational engagement that you want me to have. And so I said that. I said, I am so sorry. I just simply cannot do the thing. It's impossible for me to do the thing that you want because what, it, what you're telling me that you want is for me to be consistently and constantly open door available and that you are at everything that my family does. Otherwise, we're not friends. And the response I heard back from that is, yes, that's basically what I'm saying. And I said, I'm, I can't do that. And, and that hurt the relationship. I've been on the other side of it, though, too. I've, I've been the person with the expectation. Let me tell you how this came into my life. Uh, my, you, many of you know, if you know me, you've been around the church for a while, you know a little bit of my story. You know that my parents divorced when I was eight, and I had a really hurt and broken relationship with my dad. Praise God for what he's done in our relationship now. But there was a good chunk of season where I just didn't have any, like I didn't have a dad in my life. And in this church, as I was growing up as a boy in this church, there were men that God sent into my life that became like father figures. And then as I became an adult and a dad and, and a pastor, there were men that God sent into my life to be mentors. And it wasn't until, uh, until God was doing a, a work of healing in my own heart to set the tone for what God was doing in the relationship between my dad and all of that. It wasn't until that season, I'm already an adult, a dad, I've been a pastor for a good chunk of time, that God begins to reveal to me a regular and recurring problem in my relationship with mentors who were men in my life. 
And the problem was that I would consistently have these relationships with men uh, that, were, that were mentors in my life, that they said, man, open door, here's my phone number, call me anytime you need, let's set up a regular appointment. And I would not call them to set up a regular appointment, and then I'd get mad that they didn't call me to set up a regular appointment. And you laugh about that, and I can laugh with you about that now because that sounds silly the way that I just said that. But to me, I was having all of these men communicate to me that they didn't care about me. And I remember sitting with a friend one day and saying, what is it about me that they can't just call me? Why doesn't anybody love me? And then in that moment, I realized, oh, this is about my dad. This is actually, I've put unmet expectations from my father onto every other male authority figure in my life. And when they don't call me every week to check in on me, which I never asked them to do and they never said that they would do, I got angry and I distanced myself from those relationships. And it wasn't until God began to heal that that I could have healthier relationships with mentors in my life because I was reacting to unmet expectations. What's the point of all of this? Is that John models for us not to just sit and wallow or have a negative reaction to his unmet expectations. John didn't just go, all right, disciples, gather around. Turns out I was wrong. That Jesus guy, I know he's family. He's, turns out he's just that weird cousin. Not actually the Messiah, didn't live up to my expectations, let's keep waiting for the next guy. John doesn't do that. He confronts the issue by bringing his issue to, I mean, this is just good relational dynamics, he brought the issue to the person he had the issue with, side note, do that, but he, but he brought, on a spiritual level, he brought his issue to Jesus. This is, this is wisdom, Right? And I love, by the way, that, uh, that Jesus doesn't rebuke John the Baptist. Like, we don't get a verse in Luke 7 where and they, the guys come and they ask the question about G, of Jesus, and then, and then he goes, oh, John, what a nuisance. I wish you wouldn't ask silly questions. Or, hey, you know what? Tell John that he's either, he's either in or he's out. Don't question the Lord's anointed. How dare you, John, ask a question. He didn't say that. Now, I've heard pastors say that, but Jesus didn't say that. <laughs> I might have to finish this sermon next week. Um, there's another element here that John teaches us that is really, really helpful and wise that I, I want us not to miss. And so I, I, I'm going to take a, a minute to, to just explain this. Because wisdom shows us through John to bring your doubts and your issues and your concerns to Jesus. Wisdom also shows us to do that in the context of community. I, I love the idea that John, if he could have done it, that he would have brought his issue to Jesus himself. But he was so bound up in that moment that he couldn't get physically to Jesus. And so what did he do? He asked his friends to go to Jesus for him. What does this look like for us? This looks like bring your issues to Jesus, and when you need help, make sure you have people in your life who know how to pray with you and who know how to pray for you and will actually go to Jesus on your behalf and ask the question you're asking and will report back to you what they've heard God say. Right? I love, I absolutely love these two disciples in this moment. That they go to Jesus and they say, our friend asks this question. I love that they didn't make excuses for him. I love that they didn't uh, soften the question. I love that they didn't change the wording at all. I love the detail of Dr. Luke. Here is the question verbatim that John said, go ask Jesus this question. And here is the exact same question that they showed up and said, John is asking this. 
find people in your life who, when you say, this is what I'm going through, will say, okay, let's take that and present it exactly as you feel it is your reality right now to Jesus and let him say whatever he wants to say about that. This is good community. And John is teaching us, deal with all of your, your unmet expectations, your doubt, your pain, your questions, your challenges for Jesus. Do that in the context of community. You see, doubt is never actually resolved in isolation or by moving away from God. Doubt is resolved by moving closer to him and allowing Jesus to respond exactly the way that Jesus responded. How does Jesus respond? He doesn't give a lecture to the disciples of John the Baptist. He talks for a while to the crowd after they leave. What what does he do? He does miracles in front of them. And then he says, go tell your friend about the effective and compassionate ministry that I'm doing in the world. I love this. I love that Jesus doesn't go, all right, guys, let's sit down and have a reasoned debate. Okay, here's the deal. Here are the 33 reasons why I'm the Messiah. Are you, get, get your notebooks out, guys. Okay, reason number one. He doesn't do that. He shows them effective, powerful ministry. He shows them what the compassion of Jesus looks like when it's actively changing lives. Why? Because when you're struggling with doubt, you don't need a debate. You need a miracle. You you need a reminder that God is still active and alive and at work, right? If you're going through the season of doubt or stuck place or, or you have the questions, the things that you don't understand, I think too often we try to reason this out and we go, I'll move deeper in my relationship with Jesus when he can answer this one really hard question. I wonder what it would look like if you just got around people of faith and saw Jesus working. So what does the devil try to do? Oh, you've got questions? Shh, keep those quiet. You don't want to embarrass yourself. Right? You don't want people to find out that you haven't studied your Bible enough to already know the answer to that question. Right? Guys, look, your path, the, the guy talking to you right now, if I'm your pastor, I went to Bible college three times. I, I don't, I don't under, it doesn't compute for me if you would sit in the church and feel like there has to be some kind of level of shame for you because you don't understand the answer to a question. I had to go to college thrice to understand the answers to any questions. You're so far off, though. There's just, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is, There is no shame for you. There is no condemnation for you. It is a work of the devil in the church to try to get us to be embarrassed and ashamed about the places where we might be like John the Baptist and come to Jesus and go, when are you going to save me? This is a work of the devil in your life and in the church to get us to be embarrassed to ask the hard questions. How does Jesus respond to the hard questions? He rolls up his sleeves and he says, let me show you the fun stuff I'm doing in the world. Let me show you that I am compassionate and powerful and awesome and that I love to see people get set free. And there is a subtlety here that Jesus also responds to John by showing him miracles by saying, here are the miracles, here is how I'm setting people free, is that he's resetting John's expectation. He said, John, without ever saying a word about it, he said to John the Baptist, he said, you're expecting me to give you political power. I never said I would give you that. You're expecting me to set you free from a jail cell. I came to set you free from something much more profound than that. Right? He's resetting the focus. Why? Was this a possibility? Because John shows us that wisdom brings our doubts to Jesus. Amen? So as we do that then, may we enjoy the blessing and the the fruit of what it says in Psalm 94 verse 19. The psalmist writes, when doubts filled my mind, your comfort gave me renewed hope and cheer. Uh, I'm not in any way trying to emotionally manipulate you today. 
I, I don't need you to walk out of here and go, well, I heard a sermon about doubts, and now I'm just happy all the time. Everything's just perfect in my life. But we're, we're, we're not doing that. But it, I, I think it's pretty clear in Scripture that if we believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, we are not going to find hope and satisfaction and peace and answers outside of him. It is in bringing our doubts to him that he will give us a renewed hope and cheer. Amen? Let's see how far through this thing I can get. All right. Um, the second thing that we see John do here is that he, well, Jesus then turns to the crowd and he begins to talk about John as the disciples have left, the two disciples. He talks to the crowd and he begins to actually say, and I think we can get through two, these two things relatively quickly because th there's a very important point here, uh, is, is that, that he then begins to speak about the wisdom of John. And he says not just what he did in that moment, but the way that he has already framed out his entire life. The, the second point of the day is that Jesus then took, looks at the crowd and he says, you have to understand that John has already made his entire life about me. John has made his entire life about me. He, he says this by saying, you know, you went out there to see him, and what did you find? You found a prophet. You found a person who had already been living on mission, and he was doing it in a radical way. Jesus is referring to the baptizing ministry of John out in the wilderness. He baptizes a lot of people, including Jesus, making the way, preparing the way, because John's ministry was all about preparing the way. What was John's life about? It was about Jesus. What was it that allowed Jesus to praise John and not be worried about him when he came with his doubts? Oh, I don't need to worry about your moment of doubt, John the Baptist, my cousin and my friend and my co-laborer in the ministry of the kingdom, because I already know I've seen you do it. You have built your entire life on me. So your moment of doubt is safe. Your question and your challenge is safe in the context of having already built your life on Jesus. This is a direct callback to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Plain. The wise person is the one who builds their life on the foundation of Christ and his word because the wind and the storms come and the house will stand. We find John the Baptist in a moment of crisis, but his faith is going to stand strong because... He's already built his life on Jesus. So it's no wonder that Jesus sends his, or John sends his disciples to Jesus because Jesus was the authority of John's life. His entire life had been dedicated to this. And so then Jesus responds by speaking of John by saying, there is no one born of women who is greater than John. What a compliment. Jesus, would you give me half as good a compliment of, as that? There is no one born of women as great as John. But then Jesus, because he's a master teacher and he's up to something and he's trying to teach us a point, he immediately follows that up by saying, oh, but by the way, uh, the least in the kingdom is greater than John. Wait, what? Is he the best or is he at the end of the line? Jesus goes, yep. Yeah. Oh, you heard me right. Yeah. So why would Jesus praise John and immediately put him at the back of the line? He's not just trying to keep John humble. John's disciples didn't even hear Jesus say this. So why would he say this? Because he's trying to point to the new covenant that he's about to establish. He's trying to say to, to us, to the crowd, you have no idea how good it's about to get. Oh, John is, is great. I mean, among all of the people up to this point, there is nobody who's as great and played as significant a role as John the Baptist. Why? Because he was the one who made the way for the Messiah, right? But you know that John was an Old Testament prophet. He was still living under the old covenant. Jesus is pointing to the new covenant and saying, guys, it is about to be so good, you have no idea. John had access to Jesus because he was a family member, because he was a fellow minister, he was playing his role as a Simon in the kingdom. But you understand that he had a limited access because he was in a cage at the time and he couldn't physically get to Jesus. But the only way he could actually have any communication with Jesus is to send his disciples to where Jesus physically was. You and I do not experience that kind of limitation. So Jesus can say, the least, the 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 follower of Jesus who is the most riddled with doubts, 
but is in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. The one with more questions that go unanswered than any other follower of Christ is better and greater than John the Baptist. Why? Because you have unlimited access to the Savior of your soul. Which is something that in his lifetime John the Baptist did not have. You experienced something greater in your lifetime than him. We have no limit to our access to the King of Kings. These are the benefits of following John's wisdom and building your life on Christ. So wisdom is making the primary purpose and aim of your life, Jesus and his kingdom. And and wisdom is bringing all of your doubts and struggles and questions and challenges to Jesus by any means necessary. Whether you have friends go to Jesus with you and for you, or you go directly yourself, and hopefully you are able to do both. So final thought here, finally, Jesus then points to John's wisdom by offering a a contrast between himself and the world and between John and the world, uh, the people of the generation, right? He he says, um, ultimately, what he's saying here is John is wise because he's rejected entitlement. So let me talk about entitlement, right? To what should I compare the people of this generation? They're like a bunch of whiny babies sitting around saying, we played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament, but you didn't weep. Why didn't you do the thing that we expected and demanded for you to do? God, why didn't you perform for us? But John the Baptist, he came not eating and not drinking wine. You say, he's got a demon. The dude is weird. He must have a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. You say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus says the people of his generation are like children who are putting demands on God and complaining when their expectations are not met. And these are, these are people who rejected John because he did not do enough of the right things, and they rejected Jesus because he did too many of the wrong things. It's like, you just can't be satisfied. Your expectations are so nuanced and so ridiculous that it is impossible to please you. We might call this a religious spirit or the spirit, or the lifestyle of legalism. Jesus seems to be going after two things here, uh, the expectations that we put on God and then the expectations that we put on other people and, and blame God for those expectations. Well, if you want to be a good Christian, you have to fill in the blank with your dumb idea. So John and Jesus model resistance to the spirit of legalism, right? John and Jesus, wildly different people, wildly different people, both exactly inside the will of God for their life. Recognizing that Jesus, of course, is God himself, but I think you understand the point that Jesus is making. So wisdom would follow this advice that's found in James. James chapter 4 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Don't criticize one another, brothers and sisters. Anyone who defames or judges a fellow believer defames and judges the law. If you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Jesus has already talked about this in the Sermon on the Plain. Luke 6, 37, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Wisdom resists judging other people by unreasonable or unbiblical expectations. And wisdom rejects holding God to expectations to perform for us. Uh, Or said another way, wisdom is vindicated by all of her children. The, The foolishness of the world gets caught up in expectations that we place on God. Wisdom says, I will live in such a way that is rooted in Christ, built on the foundation of him, places no expectations on him, but is just thankful to be in relationship with him. And then every time I've got a question about something, I'll just go to the good teacher. This is why Jesus looks at John and says, no rebuke. But, hey, be reminded of the good things that I'm doing. That's my answer to whether or not I'm the Messiah. 
And he looks at the crowd and says, you have no idea how amazing John is. He's built his life on me. This is the good life. This is wisdom. Wisdom is the fruit. It's, it's seen in the fruit of the choices that you make. Okay, so now, think back to the questions that you had at the beginning of this message. In fact, I, I want to put a slightly altered version of those questions on the screen for you again as we end. As we, as we come to an end, having heard what we've heard today, I wonder if we, how we might answer the question, is my life built on Jesus? In other words, am I relying on anything other than Christ? If you wrestle with that, yeah, I, I really think I'm relying on money. Well, to what end? What eternal benefit is there to, for you to rely on money? How might you respond to that? Is my life built on Jesus? Am I holding any unreasonable or unbiblical expectations of God? God, I, I expect or expected that I would never suffer again if I gave my life to you an unreasonable and unbiblical expectation. Jesus says in this world you will have trouble, but don't be afraid because I have overcome the world. You will have trouble, but in trouble you don't have to be afraid. Scripture doesn't say he would remove all of your trouble. He said, I'll, make a tab I'll, I'll set a table for you in the midst of your enemies. Are there any big questions that I need to be asking Jesus this week? By the way, I, I'm posing this question for you with the assumption that you will go and ask that question this week, right? So you write down in your phone or maybe you set a reminder in your phone or write down in your, in your journal, a question I have for Jesus is about, and you fill in the blank with your question. I, I need to know about this. I've got questions about when are you going to do, how are you going to provide for, how are you going to fix this? These are the questions. And what would it look like for you to bring that to Jesus this week? And then the fourth question is simply, who else will I share this question with so they can pray? Who else? Who else knows It's interesting how we have a framework for confession of sin. We don't have a, as much of a framework for a confession for prayer requests. It's like we feel like we're putting a burden on somebody. Hey, will you pray for me? I, I've actually heard people say, I don't want to be a burden to you. So, uh, and then I, well, how can I pray? Well, I don't, want to, I don't want to ask you to do too much. To talk to God? I love doing that. Let's just un, undo, throw out, get rid of all of the, the burden. Just who would you talk to? Just imagine a universe where you could think, man, my, the, the person I would just absolutely love to share this with so that they could pray for me and with me this week would be, and then the person that comes to your mind. Uh, imagine a world where they said yes. You know how you'll find out if they say yes? Because they're so smart. I had to go to college three times to understand that. Final question, not on the screen. Final question of the day. Is there anything you need to say to God right now? Let's take a moment. And I know I've asked you to write down a lot, and some of you are going to keep doing that. But can you just pause for just a moment? And, and in this space, in this environment, is there anything that you need to say to God today? I want to just give you a, a, a private moment to say whatever you need to say to God. Jesus, we come before you today with our confessions, with our struggles, with our questions, with our, some of us maybe even our frustration and anger. We confess to you that we have issues 
and we say to you now what we need to say. Friends, I, I want you to understand, I hope that you would believe that you even can bring, if it is anger that you are experiencing, you can even bring that to God. He is big enough to carry even that. Holy Spirit, would you minister peace to the places where we are speaking to you now? Jesus, we come to you. And we say in the places where we have expectations that are unreasonable or, or, or where we hold on to things that we thought that you would do for us that you really never said that you would do. But we recognize that we do that because in our flesh at times we can be selfish people. Because at times we really just want a God who will serve us. In the places where that is the reality in our lives, would you forgive us and would you humble us? Lord, we know that we can be prone to judgment and to legalism and to holding other people to standards, just like we hold you to standards that are unbiblical and unreasonable. In the places in our lives where we do that, would you forgive us and would you humble us, God? Lord, we also have doubts and we have questions. And so we thank you that you don't rebuke us for our doubts and our questions, but you welcome us in and you love us in every one of our doubts and you love us in all of our questions and you respond to all of them. And God, thank you that the way you respond to our questions is even better than what we could have thought would have been the answer if we had put words in your mouth. Thank you, God, for knowing the best way to respond. Thank you, God, for the people in our lives who will help us to come to you. Lord, would you help us to turn to you quickly? Would you increase our faith? Would you give us peace? Would you increase our trust and give us wisdom? We do humbly, God, ask you to answer our questions, to fill us with your Holy Spirit, to show us what your word says about the matters of our lives and the questions and the doubts and the concerns and the difficult places where we find ourselves. We ask all of this so that we can understand you and learn your ways and learn more to walk in the unforced rhythms of your grace. Take our burdens, God. Heal our hearts. Do miracles in our lives and give us wisdom on the journey. Give us friends to journey with. We set our focus on you. God, help us to be like John, returning to you and pointing to you in all things. And as we learn to live like that, Jesus, would you be the Savior of those that we encounter, just as you have been our Savior? Lord God, we pray these things. We ask these things. And we trust you in these things. Friends, may you experience peace as you learn to come to Jesus with every heavy thing. May you experience his light yoke. And may you be a blessing as you walk this way in the world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.